Hey, good evening, and welcome. It is time once again for CU Immigration here on WRFU LP, Urbana, 104.5 FM. I will be your host for this evening. My name is Mr. Garza, and I'm here to let you know that WRFU is an open forum for the Urbana Champaign community. Views expressed are those of the speakers and are not intended to represent WRFU, UCIMC, Urbana Socialist Forum, or as we like to say on the televised version of this show, UPTV. These views are our own, and by our, in this instance, I probably mostly mean it in the sense of the royal we, uh, since it's just me, there's no one else here. But, uh, you know, there may be opinions uh, kind of embedded, encoded, embodied in the uh, text of the, you know, the stories that I read. And so some of that is likely to come through, even if I don't intend it to, it, it'll be there. So there are views in there other than mine, because um, <clears throat> I don't necessarily 100% agree with everything that I read, obviously. I'm sure you don't either. But, uh, you know, I'm just trying to be specific because uh, the disclaimer, you know, it's a legal document. And, um, yeah, <laughs> it's a legal document. And so if, it's, if we're going to be all, you know, legalistic about it and, and say, oh, well, uh, then, you know, I'll, I'll do that, and I'll, be, I'll very, be very precise about those things. <coughs> so you may get whiffs of views. You may get uh, hints of views that are neither mine nor any of these other uh, aforementioned uh, entities. And you might say to yourself, oh, but there was a, yeah, there was a view in there. <laughs> well, if there is, and it's from something I'm reading, then blame the thing I'm reading. Or take your ire out on uh, the you know the fake news as Herr Trump likes to uh, describe it. Anyway, um, welcome back or welcome back to me, Tom. Welcome back to uh, this show. It's been a while. Uh, it's it's uh, you know not it was not entirely intentional break there. It's more basically uh, weather. And uh, distractions, stuff going on that I just couldn't get out of or avoid. Um, but I will admit that along with that, there was a certain kind of, I don't want to call it depression. It's not really depression, but just this sort of sense of like, you know what? I just can't deal with the thought of sitting here and talking about immigration for an hour, uh, it's just too depressing. I mean, there really is not, like, good news to speak of. There are little hints here and there. There are little, like, uh, kind of, I don't know what you'd call them, like, uh, not hint. Hint is the wrong word, but just, you know, just kind of a, a teasing sort of off in the distance this sense like, oh, there might be something good coming this way. But, you know, most of what you can see and touch and and realistically like say, okay, that's heading towards me right now is just plain bad. There, I mean, there's like nothing good um, on the immigration front that you can really latch on to. There are a few things. I'm going to read a story that has some sort of nice-ish um, potential, maybe. But all in all, and generally speaking, there isn't just a, uh, isn't a much good news. It's all bad. And that is all due to uh, the current administration that was voted in, like it or not, that has power, like it or not. And generally speaking, I mean, I would say there's a racist component to it, but even if you don't want to take that step, you want to like back off a little bit and say, okay, well, nah, you know, racist, that's a strong statement, you know. Um, <clears throat> all right, it is a strong statement. I, I feel that <clears throat> if it came down to defending it, I could. 
I could say, well, what about this and this and this and this and this? I mean, it seems pretty obvious to me, but if you're going to balk at that, at the R word, then I think it's safe to say at least that the, the current administration, starting at the top, the this person that is acting as president or acting like a president, or not really acting, much like a president, acting in the capacity of a president, <laughs> whether he's actually acting like a president or not, I think um, that's a very debatable point. But he's acting in the capacity of a president. Uh, the person who is acting in the capacity of the attorney general, and so on and so forth. Um, I think it is safe to say, if, if we're avoiding the R word, that these people pretty much just want anybody that isn't, wasn't born here to go away. Now, there are certain exceptions to that. There are people that they really, really, really want to go away. And then there are people who are there more like, uh, you know, they're not adverse to creating policies that make it hard for those people, but they're not actively trying to get rid of. Uh, hence, uh, the sense of, of the old R term coming in, the sense that there's a racist component to it. There is a certain constituency that seems to be the object of uh, the, this great desire to remove. If, how about if I put it that way? Um, and, you know, what can you do? <laughs> you can read that in a number of different ways, but the, the way I read it is that they don't want those people from those places uh, in this country. Pretty much simply that and uh, not much more. There's no real economic reason for this right now. There's nothing, you know, we, we don't have bread lines or people, you know, starving in the streets or anything and like, uh, you know, not enough jobs to go around or anything like that. I mean, we're not in that situation. There have been times not that long ago when you could use that argument and it was at least something that, uh, you know, everyone would have to argue about and go, oh, well, but it doesn't, you know, it's not this fault and it's not that person's fault and it isn't because of this and it is, you know, and it was hard to say that there was a lot of, there were, was, there were a lot of ways to construct narratives around whichever side of that question you fell on that were at least you know, uh, difficult to disprove unless you were an economist and unless you had the, the latest facts and figures at, at your uh, fingertips and, and all that sort of thing. But I would say the economy is pretty well chugging along right now. And so the economic argument for removing immigrants is pretty slim. They will make that argument, of course. They continue to. They, they make every argument but the one, well, I mean, some of them <laughs> go ahead and just make the racist one, uh, you know, keep our nation heritage pure or whatever the heck they, they do it. But, you know, they do make a lot of arguments and really very few of them carry much weight. Uh, so really there is not a whole lot of you know, strong uh, force behind this idea that, you know, we must, we must get rid of Im immigrants, you know. There just isn't. And yet, they continue as if it's a plague that must be dealt with in one way or another. And that is pretty much how they see it, I think. It's a plague. These, all these people, those people, from those places who are here. Oh, if there's any way you can construe that those people shouldn't be here, then every effort must be made to get rid of them. I mean, that's pretty much where they stand. 
and uh, and that's pretty much what they are doing. And it's uh, it's pretty scary. For example, from the Washington Post. Um, let's see, January 8th, yeah, today. <clears throat> Article entitled, We Will Lose Practically Everything. Salvadorans Devastated by TPS Decision. So I'll read this, so we put it in context here. Um, Oscar Cortez feels like he has an ordinary American life. He carries a Costco card. He roots for the Boston Red Sox. And five days a week, he rises before dawn, pulls on four shirts and two pairs of pants, and ventures into the frigid air to work as a plumber, a good job that pays for his Maryland townhouse and his daughter's college fund. The U.S. government opened the door to this life in 2001 when it granted Cortez and about 200,000 other migrants from El Salvador temporary protected status. TPS, a provisional reprieve from deportation that has allowed them to work legally in the United States for 17 years. And I'm going to pause briefly here to ask you to think about how long 17 years is. 17 years ago, it was 2001. That's almost two decades. So just think about what all has happened in your life, what kinds of changes, what you've gone through, just, you know, I'm just asking, I'm not asking for a big, you know, soul searching thing, but just think for a second, like how long 17 years is and what kind of roots you can put down, what kind of uh, connections you can make in that, in that kind of period of time. Okay, so I will continue. So on Monday, the federal government said the protection will end in September 2019, sending waves of outrage and anxiety from Washington to Los Angeles and to the Central American nation itself. In Bethesda, Maryland, a janitor at Walter Reed National Military Medical Center burst into tears. Before a news conference in Dallas, an advocate who has TPS took a moment to comfort his daughter, who is in the fifth grade and is worried that both her parents will soon have to leave the United States. At 15th and L Streets in Washington, Cortez saw the news on his mobile phone while taking a break from laying copper pipe at the construction site of the new Fannie Mae headquarters. You feel like you're up in the air, the silver-haired 46-year-old said. I feel bad and offended. They're playing with our stability. Congress created the TPS program in 1990 to offer provisional humanitarian relief to migrants whose homelands were engulfed in war, natural disasters, or other extraordinary conditions. Critics say past presidents misused the program by allowing it to drag on long after the emergencies passed. Salvadorans were allowed to apply for two oh, excuse me, allowed to apply after two powerful earthquakes devastated their country in 2001. Many had come to the United States illegally or overstayed their visas, but they have since been vetted, bought homes, and raised families. I consider this my country, Cortez said. The largest number of Salvadoran TPS residents, about 32,000 people, live in the Washington area, studies show followed by Los Angeles, New York, and Houston. They are the parents of about 190,000 children who were born in this country and are U.S. citizens. Helen Avalos, a 41-year-old janitor at Walter Reed National Military Medical Center, has three children, two grandchildren, and a house in New Carrollton. Her mother in El Salvador depends on the money she sends home. It doesn't just affect one person, she said on Monday's decision, her voice shaking. It affects the whole family. Though they have desperately tried to preserve it, Salvadorans say they have mixed feelings about TPS, which never offered them a path to legal residency. Every 18 months, they worried that the next extension would be the last. Now they will pour their energy into lobbying Congress to pass a law and let them stay. 
The reality is that TPS never took us anywhere, but it is also terrible to, to be left without anything, said Edwin Murillo, an official with the Dallas chapter of the National TPS Alliance, who spent part of Monday reassuring his daughter and, prepare, and part of it preparing to fight. We've lost a battle, but not the war, said Orlando Zepeda, a TPS holder from Los Angeles. We're going to pull all our efforts into this fight. Zepeda arrived at age 17, too late for the 1986 amnesty for undocumented immigrants signed by President Ronald Reagan. Now he is 52 and married to a fellow TPS holder with two U.S.-born children who, whom he sends to a private school. Labor leaders said Salvadorans with protected status mop floors in Washington museums and empty wastebacks, waste baskets at the World Bank. They are also construction workers, business owners, managers, and investors. A mass exodus would impact the D.C. workforce and economy, as well as the economy in El Salvador, where TPS holders send millions of dollars to family members each year. It is going to be devastating for us, said Prince George's County Executive Russian L. Baker III. Whether it's construction or the service industry, the impact it will have is just devastating. Many Salvadorans say they will try to stay in the United States illegally, a fate they find more bearable than facing the rampant gang violence in their homeland. Cortez said he visited his parents in 2016 for the first time since he left and was shocked to see that the house had six locks on every door to ward off burglars. People he knew had left or died. Strangers stared at him on the street. I felt like a foreigner in my own land, he said. Everyone is looking at you like you're from outer space. His co-worker, Jamie Contreras, a welder on the project that will extend Metro Rail to Dulles International Airport, said TPS and his job have transformed his family, both in Maryland and in El Salvador. As a child in El Salvador, Contreras went to school in the mornings and to work in the afternoons, painting houses at age 7 and welding at 11. At 20, he moved to the United States seeking higher wages. Now he is 37 and the owner of a modest brick, yellow brick house in Beltsville, where he lives with his wife and three U.S.-born children. He sends $300 a month to his mother in El Salvador to pay for treatments for her failing kidneys. My children, my wife, and my mom depend on all this, and me too, he said. Both men said they are hoarding their savings in case they lose their jobs along with their protected status. Cortez has put off replacing his old Mitsubishi Montero with 150,000 miles and a sputtering engine. Like many TPS recipients, they say they will try to obtain legal residency. His wife is a legal resident and Cortez hopes she will someday be able to sponsor him. Contreras said he is trying to get a green card through his wife, a U.S. citizen, but there are no guarantees. It's ugly, Contreras said. Without legal papers, we will lose practically everything. Cortez nodded. We'll lose our jobs, he said. We'll lose it all. So the, aside from the human angle that you obviously must get from this unless you're, I don't know, cold-blooded, you're a lizard, something, a turtle, um, is that you see here is a problem, and I will acknowledge that it's a problem. TPS is a problem because it's, it doesn't fix something. It just defers it. It says, okay, well, you know, we'll let you hear, but, you know, we're not going to really do anything to make it official, to make it, uh, you know, possible for you to stay or to make you, you know, any, anything like that. We're just going to not, it's like DACA. It's like, we're just going to not deport you. We're going to let you work. We're going to let you live. We're going to let you do stuff, but we're not going to welcome you in. We're not leaving that door open. We're keeping that door closed. So you can sit on the front porch, you can hang out there, you can do whatever you want, you know, you can treat this like your home, only you can't come in. 
So yeah, TPS is a problem. The way most people have dealt with that problem over time is to say, well, it would be too disruptive, too cruel to individuals, to people, to just send them home. Uh, but it's a really hard sell politically to let them in, so we're just going to continue the thing. So they basically, everyone has been just kicking the can down the road, leaving it for someone else to deal with. It is very, very unfortunate that the people who have the will, the political will, if you will, <laughs> um, to deal with it are these folks who don't care. They just clearly do not care about any problems they're causing, about any disruptions, about any de destroyed hopes and dreams, about any families torn apart. None of those things. They do not care about that. All they care is their ideologues, basically, on this issue, if not on any other. Um, and the only thing they care about is just keeping a sort of a purity to their ideology, which is if you're not from here and you're kind of on the brown side, then you should go away. We just don't want you here. That's the only thing I can see. I mean, you heard that story. You just listened to the whole thing all the way through. You see the problem. If you were president right now, um, and it was time for TPS to be renewed, chances are that, that you would probably do what Obama did and Bush and, and everyone and just kind of take the easy route and go, okay, let's just renew it and then we'll deal with it later. We'll just deal with it later and we'll renew it. That has been a bad thing. It has been bad every time everybody did it and it continues to be a bad thing, but it's a less bad thing than this what these guys have done. What these guys have done is said, I don't care. I don't care what happens. I don't care who gets hurt. I don't care whose life is destroyed. Um, I just don't care about that. I just don't want these people here. And we're going to get rid of them. So they don't care about the economy, obviously. The economic question is just absurd. They're, what they're thinking, apparently, maybe, possibly, I don't know, economically speaking, is like, oh, we'll just rip this guy out from his job. He's deported. And then some American, i.e. white person, can come in and get that job and get that money. And boy, that's going to be great for them. It doesn't really work that way. But that may be if they are thinking in any, then any other, other than, God, I can't even think. If they are thinking in any way other than, how's that, um, simply playing racist terms like uh, let's purify the, <laughs> the bloodline here in the U.S. or something like that, uh, that's as close as I can come to a rationalization. This guy doesn't deserve it because he's, he's a foreigner and he should never have come here in the first place and we don't want him. So he can go away. It doesn't matter how badly he gets hurt because he shouldn't have been here in the first place. I think on some level, somebody is maybe thinking like that. I believe that everyone else is just thinking, hey, he's brown. That's good. Let's get rid of him. I don't know. But yeah, I'm, I'm going back and forth on my ability to avoid the R word here because all I see is just straight up racism. If not directly, I hate Mexicans or people from south of the border type racism, then maybe on the other end of that spectrum and uh, in the I love white people and uh, th those are the only people that should be here. Those are the only people that deserve to be here. So any way that I can get rid of anybody else is a good thing. I don't know which it is. But I have no doubt that it is some blend of those two in some way. But like I said at the beginning of the show, I'm trying to avoid the R word. So um, I don't know what's left. <laughs> I don't know how I can describe this event in any other way. 
If you do, I would be interested in hearing it because I do not understand that. Yes, TPS is a problem. It has long been a problem. Yes, it has been bad that people have avoided dealing with it. Is this the solution to that? No, absolutely not. Not in any way. My opinion, my view expressed by me, not underwritten or endorsed by WRFU, UC IMC, Urbana Socialist Forum, or UPTV. That's just my opinion. Take it or leave it as you will. Okay, <clears throat> next up, I'm going to try at least to inject a little semi-goodish -good news, sort of, if I can call it that, from CNN. Exclusive. Ooh, a CNN exclusive. Pair of lawmakers unveil bipartisan DACA plan. Woohoo! Sounds like something, doesn't it? Maybe. A bipartisan pair of House members have reached a compromise on deferred action for childhood arrivals and border security, a plan the two unlikely allies hope could provide a foundation for a deal President Trump could sign into law. <laughs> Good luck with that. Um, sorry. Editorial aside, ignore it, if you will. Representatives Will Hurd, a Texas Republican, and Pete Aguilar, a California Democrat, and a whip for the Congressional Hispanic Caucus have been quietly working for weeks to develop their legislation, which the two sophomore lawmakers are releasing as a discussion draft as talks heat up on DACA ahead of government funding deadline, January 19th, being used as leverage in Congress. The hope is, they say, that putting out a bipartisan proposal could speed up talks about resolving the issue. The plan aims to be as narrow as possible, Heard told CNN in an exclusive joint interview with Aguilar on Sunday night about the proposal. The legislation draws heavily from other proposed legislation, a conscious decision by the two congressmen to lean on language that had already been vetted by committees and lawmakers, they say. At the core of the deal would be a legislative way to enact DACA, an Obama administration program that protected young undocumented immigrants who came to the U.S. as children from deportation that Trump has decided to end. The bill would offer qualifying individuals the ability to get in line for a green card and eventual citizenship after years of conditional residency, provided they meet certain requirements, including a background check and work, education, or military service. The bill doesn't make explicit reference to sponsoring relatives, but the bill summary notes that existing law would prohibit parents of these individuals who came to the U.S. illegally to apply for a visa to come back without returning to their home country for at least 10 years before applying, and the bill does nothing to erase that requirement. That addresses so-called chain migration or family-based migration that Trump says he wants to cut. Other provisions include increasing the number of immigration judges and attorneys, as the, as the Justice Department has sought, to reduce the lengthy backlog of cases in immigration courts that cause people to stay in the U.S. in limbo for years. The bill also coordinates efforts to improve conditions in Central America to address factors that send undocumented immigrants to the U.S. For the border, the bill draws heavily from Heard's Smart Wall Bill that would direct the Department of Homeland Security to gain operational control of the border by the end of 2020 through technology, 